This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. PlutoSoft is a comprehensive financial planning software and CRM program. It covers every part of the advice process, fact-finding, strategy modelling, portfolio management, life insurance, SOA and report generation. Plus, it includes workflow management and a client hub portal. PlutoSoft helps financial planning firms produce high-quality advice in a fraction of the time and has an extensive range of platform data feeds. As the industry's complete all-in-one solution, PlutoSoft has helped rocket fuel the success of leading financial planning firms around Australia. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with Josh Pennell. Um, Josh is an advisor and director at Prosper Advisory based down in uh, sunny Victoria. Um, keen to, to pick Josh's brain on uh, the growth of his business as well as some of the stuff that he's been doing around uh, client engagement over the last little bit. So, Josh, thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks, Ben. And, mate, don't start out by uh, picking on Melbourne's weather. Winter is starting and this is when Melbourneans start getting really angry at you northerners. So um, just be nice to us, all right? <laughs> Well, you guys have had a good run over the last little bit, but the tides, the tides are coming. So <laughs> that's it, mate. I thought a good place to start would be: can you just run us through sort of the what your business looks like? You know, the sorts of people you work with, client numbers, team, etc. Yeah, sure. Well, just a quick snapshot of the really long term background. The business has been going in different forms for about eighty years, um, and at its peak in size was a two office, six partner, roughly 60 staff business. But the current structure of the business, having broken those two offices into separate companies around about 15 years ago, um, and I bought half the business 10 years ago, is the Melbourne office, 13 people in total, two owners, and we have uh, accounting and financial planning divisions. Um, myself and my business partner own the whole business together, but day to day we predominantly work on one side each, the accounting for my business partner and then financial planning for myself. And probably around half our clients use both services of, um, of accounting and financial planning, which, which works really well. So in a nutshell, that's us. Nice. And what sort of clients are, are you working with and, and what are you doing for them? Yeah, so we've probably still got about a third of our clients um, who are who are retirees, and that comes mainly from the fact of that long term history of the business and um, you know some of the the clients that were there when I joined. But in terms of new clients we're bringing in, uh, we do still see a few pre and post retirees coming into the business. But from a more proactive marketing perspective, we're mainly working with busy professional families. So. They're usually aged in their 40s, um, youngish kids, white collar, high incomes and or they own a business of their own. Um, and then also about five years ago, I went through a separation and divorce and through that learnt a lot about the family law field and therefore we also do quite a lot of work with divorcees as well. Yeah, interesting. I was uh, having a bit of a stalk on your website and check that out and I think it's... Um a great approach to I suppose you know when people are going through that's obviously it's a pretty tricky time but um for them to know that you you got that that experience there um it sounds like the from the time that you joined the business that you've you've sort of pivoted the uh the 
the client focus. Tell me, how did you go about tackling that in terms of, you know, who you wanted to target, why, and then and then what you needed to do to, I suppose, behind the scenes to create something that's compelling for that market? Yeah, well, I think like a lot of us, uh, because of where the money often sits with superannuation and, and retirees, often that is a, a space that makes sense for a lot of people to be operating in. And that was certainly a lot of the types of clients I'd worked with throughout my career in in all my roles. But I just sort of felt that um, after probably, you know, say 12, 13 years in, in the industry, it was maybe getting um, a little bit repetitive in terms of working with the same client all the time and, and focusing on the same advice issues and needs of those retirees. So for me, it was a little bit about finding something that reinvigorated me and it was also a bit more authentic to where I'm at in life. So I'm 40 this year. As I mentioned, been through a divorce um, and my partner and I have got four kids. So for me, it was more about working with other people that I relate to and they relate to me. And that's what led to kind of that evolution of who we're marketing to and, and how we're doing that so that it's a good match for the client and also um, us in, in working with them. And how did you go about actually building out the, the service solution? I know that you've been through um, the, the KPI program, which I've also done um, as mm. well. It sounds like potentially the shift started happening before you engaged in that though, like in terms of what you do, because obviously it's a little bit different in terms of the what is front of mind for a pre and post retiree client versus what's front of mind for a 35 year old um, accumulator or a 40 year old person that's going through a, through a separation. Um, Yeah. How did you actually tackle that? Yeah. So the initial iteration probably about six years ago was something called the young millionaires club. And that was an offering to young high, high income earners Maybe they haven't started a family yet, but they were sort of, say, around age 30. They were now progressing their careers, maybe earning two to three times what they were when they first left university, but perhaps weren't actually putting that resource to good use. And I was essentially at a stage where probably a fair few of my friends fit in that boat and I was just, rather than it being like, oh, they're my mates, I don't care, It's it's not my place it was kind of starting to annoy me because I knew the power of time and compounding the things that these Mm. people could be doing with these great incomes. So I didn't then go and approach all my friends to become clients, but I did build an offering that fitted that demographic. And first, that was the first protocol and that went quite well. And we did definitely bring on a lot of clients with that. But what I started realizing was that it was probably about 10 years too young where we were targeting for it to be a more commercial offering in terms of we're dealing with a lot of people that hadn't received advice, um, some of the motivations to to continue getting advice such as kids and mortgages and greater responsibility weren't quite in their life just yet. And mm. so whilst it is still a great service for people, I know there are a lot of people out there who, who focus on that demographic, especially more so these days, um, I then evolved it into something that's now called Fulfilled Family Wealth and that more came out of the KPI program where I started thinking more about the clients that were having greater needs and reasons for advice. Mm. Therefore, we were able to do more for them, add more value and also it was a lot easier to get them engaged and on board because they were really at a stage at, you know, at say age 40 instead of 30 and having the mortgage and maybe a business and, again, an even higher income and the kids and the private school fees and the this and the that where they were just actually really crying out for advice. So they were on the front foot a lot more. Um, and it also fit a lot more with where where I was now at in life with, with young kids and running my own business for quite a while by then, um, the life experience of, of a divorce. I also had a startup business in a separate field that I learned a lot from. So... Yeah, just evolved it to um, fit those various benefits uh, that I mentioned. Yeah, nice. Yeah, it's um, similar, I suppose, to a little bit to to my journey at Pivot that when I started the business, it was attracting younger clients. And I think our message still does speak to um, people in their earlier stage. But 
also like what we realize and especially as like all of the behind the scenes stuff has increased so drastically in advice over the last few years it's like you want to have a solution where you've got clients that you can add a lot of value quickly and then you can take you can charge extra fees to spend the extra time to to get the best results for them as well i think yeah thankfully i think tech is making it a bit easier that um it, you know it creates an ability to leverage us to um service different other markets but i think for that full shebang fp stuff that yeah, the more the more you've got going on, the, the easier it is, especially when you focus on having a really robust solution. Definitely. Josh, we were chatting a little bit uh, offline over the last little bit and you were talking that around the fact that you have been heavily focused around your client engagement process over the last little while. Can you tell us about how that came about, you know, how you tackled it and, and what some of the outcomes yeah. were there? Yeah, so the first part of it was through the KPI course where, for those who haven't heard of this course, um, if you Google key person of influence or dent, then you, you know, check it out. Definitely a course I got a lot of value out of. Um, and, and some of the good things they teach you in that course are around, you know, how you're pitching to your ideal client um, and what tools and, and products you are using in order to do that. And two of the most valuable ones that I got from doing the course was um, – a, a brochure that we put together through the course that really forces you to articulate your client target um, and how you help them and and why and how you add value to them. And then also one page um, snapshots of what your process is that, that aren't wordy but that are quite graphical and also your specific method for providing advice. So what is it, what is your unique proposition that sets you apart from other advisors in how you go about it and we had to create create all that from scratch which um, led to some some nights of me tossing and turning in bed trying to come up with these solutions of oh, I've got to get this done for this course and I've just got nothing like where am I going with this um, mm. but like a lot of things eventually a light bulb goes off when you just you know muck around with it enough times and get your your pad and pen out and start scribbling out ideas so that helps me come up with that fulfilled family wealth offering and be really clear on who it was for what we did for them um, where they would start from when they come to us and what their common issues and headaches and stresses and pain points were um, what their common goals and needs were from an advice perspective and be able to really paint a clear picture of why we were the solution for them and for me, it was very easy because it, it's very easy to be authentic when you are pretty much a, an identical mirror image of the client you're trying to attract. Mm. So as I said, I can say I've got kids. I can say I run a business. I can say I've been investing since I was age 15. I understand the, the good and bad and the opportunities and sometimes stresses that come with that when you know, markets mm. are up and down and things yeah. like that. So it wasn't difficult to... Um, paint a picture for those clients about why we were a great solution for them. Um, so that's where a lot of it started from. And then having those tools available for our existing clients and if we want to hold a webinar or an event or um, onboard a new client, um, they're, they're really valuable ways for us to kind of get that early comfort with a prospect who otherwise might not know us at all. Yeah, nice. And what were the what do you think we were the areas that it positively impacted the most? Or to say it a different way, like what were the things that were not working as well before you put this in place that are working better now? Yeah. So first thing was getting clear on who it was we were targeting. Then it was coming up with some of the collateral that resonates with that and is um, attractive to them. So you know, using actual marketing experts and proper designers and investing in the time and money to get the quality marketing materials. Uh, we also built something uh, like a client survey kind of scorecard tool, which we also now send to all our prospects before they meet with us. Um, and that's got some thought-provoking questions and they receive a personalised results report of how they're tracking. And I think that I, you know the, the questions are deliberately leading, so to speak, 
to help people see, oh, gee, I hadn't actually thought about that or I haven't dealt with that, but I have done that. So it's sort of like, okay, you're doing well in these areas. You're not doing well in those yep. areas. So it, start, it starts to become clearer to them the areas to focus on and the value that can be added and the fact that they don't actually have everything in a row and they do need to work on some some key areas. Mm. So that's been helpful. So another thing we did was spent the time getting a lot of Google reviews um, from existing clients. So these days I know that I certainly Google any service provider I'm going to use. So the social proof element has been, I think, quite powerful in people being able to see that and do their research on us in the background. Um, so I feel like by the time the client gets to the first meeting now, they're already a lot more along the process and journey and quite a lot more comfortable with who we are, what we're about, and the fact that we are probably a great solution for them. So the number of things stopping them from proceeding are already a lot less. In addition to that, when I first started in the industry, it was sort of the old school, have a first meeting, sit there and fill out the fact find in paper. It wasn't necessarily mm. the best way to do it, but at least you were gathering a lot of the information you needed. A few years ago, we went away from that because we were concerned that it wasn't conversational enough and wasn't engaging enough for the client. We weren't, didn't want it to feel mm. too structured and rigid. But one of the downsides to that was it, it did probably take our focus off making sure we made it a efficient and well-structured process for the client to be able to have everything they needed, say everything they need to tell us and be in a position to make a decision about whether they were comfortable to work with us. So a few months ago, I sat down and bit the bullet and knew it was going to be a bit of a tough uh, process and just spent a lot of time completely restructuring our initial engagement process and I also took a step back so to speak to hopefully take some steps forward and I took the prospecting meetings back off the team and started doing them again myself I was doing some still but in many cases I was finding opportunities and then passing them directly to the team so I just wanted to get back in there myself and see the potential different things that weren't getting us the level of conversion I thought we should be getting Hmm. And the main change I made was cut our initial um, client process down from three meetings to one, um, making sure that we are sending them things like our brochure, the scorecard tool um, and other information like the fact I've written a book. I haven't finished it yet, but just mentioning that, trying to build up our profile in their mind of being seen as the expert before they even come to the meeting. Um, also introduced a pre-first meeting screening phone call, just a five to ten minute, hi, how are you going, where are you at, what do you need, so that if we or they don't feel it's a good fit, then we don't actually progress to that longer first meeting. just saves everyone a lot of time and, and headaches. Um, and also that helps that initial bit of relationship building as well. What I do now as well is before, once the first meeting is booked in and I've they've already seen all these other items I mentioned, all I ask them for is a high-level summary of their current financial position and their key goals. And the way I communicate that is tell me what you want, when, and how much it's going to cost. And I deliberately make sure they know it doesn't need to be in the nth degree of detail. And I then plug that information into an otherwise predominantly templated presentation for the first meeting. The first meeting then covers why we are the providers to people like them. So an explanation that we are like you, we understand you, you are our why, you know, the Simon Sinek style of why do you do Mm. what you do. Um, Mm -hmm. Then I show a photo of me and my family really getting that, making them really genuinely say, okay, this guy's the guy for us because he is us sort of thing. So that's where I start. But it's just a very brief thing because you want to make sure the first meeting is as much about the client, not you, as possible. And then I go into the, all right, you've sent me these this information about your current situation and your goals and I spend as much time on that as the client needs and I, I ask the same questions sometimes two or three times just to make sure that absolutely everything they've got to tell me and want to tell me is, is out on the table about what they're looking for. And then I spend around about 15 minutes 
explaining to them the value of advice, um, our approach to advice and using the unique method we've developed, using the, the one-page process document we've developed so they know what to expect, they know what's coming. Um, I'll show them an example of a financial plan. I'll show them an example of investment research and projections and the way we uh, put together portfolios and basically take it away from selling a service to selling a tangible thing that they can see and visualise, so sort of show, not just tell. Mm -hmm. Um, And I always say to them, you know, if you're buying a car, you can physically touch, see, drive, understand what you're buying. But whenever we're buying a service, we we can't see it. So as much as possible, I, I help them see what financial planning is, as you know, what's the end product, so to speak, they're going to actually receive. I explain what to expect. Um, I, I give them a bit of motivation around why it's important to act sooner rather than later. So actually try and get a bit of urgency happening with them because we do all know the the cost of not prioritising and managing your money well for as long as possible, just purely the time and compounding considerations and, and lost opportunities. So you want what you want people to actually start on this stuff sooner rather than later. And I use the example of myself of, of investing from 15 and now at nearly 40 seeing the power that that has had for me. Um, I clearly outline all the costs, um, what it's going to cost, um, how they pay, what it looks like, and basically get them to a point in roughly 45 minutes where they've felt that they've been really clear on what they want and need. I've been really clear on why we are a good solution for them, what the process will look like and what it will cost. And it's just meant that in one meeting instead of three, uh, we're getting a much higher conversion and thankfully it's been a 100% conversion. Usually we would book a meeting for a week later. Um, some people might have heard of BAMFAM, which is book a meeting from a meeting. Mm. Um, to make sure you, you're continuing the process and even if you end up getting a no from the client, at least you've got that now and you can move on and they can move on and you're not chasing and wondering what's happening. So, yeah, we booked that meeting in for a week in advance, but what we're finding is in most cases we're getting an email from the client the next day saying, oh, we don't need that next meeting. We're, we've chatted about it overnight and we're good to go. We're happy to go ahead. So That's yeah, awesome. That's Yeah, in a nutshell how we're approaching it and we're seeing it's working really well. I think that that thing on saving time and getting to an efficient answer is is super important because, as you say, your clients are busy, you guys are busy. I think that you need to recognise, especially when you've got a specific sort of solution that you want to deliver or group of people that you want to work with, that it's okay when someone says no or if they're not the right fit. And I think you need to, it's, out, it's on us to really give them the information to make that decision and ideally make the decision with as minimal time commitment from them and from us as as mm. possible. Um, yep. So I think, yeah, I think it's similar to what we do where, you know, trying to share with them things before the meetings. We even tell, go like go through our services and things ahead of time so the people know and if they, you know, if they we try to show them the value, which is difficult to get across in content or a video without having the conversation, but some people just aren't prepared to pay, you know, a certain amount of money for a financial advisor. So that's okay. Yeah. Like that's obviously on them. We're, obviously we're completely biased and we think it's worth, you know, 10 times uh, what we charge and our clients see that once they get to the other side. But um, if they're yeah. not, then it's not like you we were saying, like you don't want to waste an hour of their time or two or three hours of their time to get to that mm. point. It's like give them enough to go, okay, well, yeah, I think it's worth continuing the conversation on, no, actually, this um, this isn't for me. And I think some advisors, I think, are a little bit fearful of that, you know, n- not not pushing back on people if it doesn't it seem like they're all in or or exactly a match. But I think ultimately, yeah, like you, you're doing them, you're saving them time and doing them a service and saving yourself time in, in the process um, yeah. a, as well. Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt it, it works much better better for everyone the way we're doing it now um and yeah if they want to work with us great if they don't yeah unfortunately not going to win every single one is it cost is it they don't like you is it whatever it doesn't really matter just Mm. try and find as many that that are a good fit as possible 
Um, and as I said, thankfully so far we're we're going at one hundred percent. Very small sample size, only six done since I changed the process. But yeah, noticing a significant impact already, and we've got um, four or five more coming up soon. And then then the evolution of that will be. I'm getting team members in those meetings. I'm running them, but the team members are there seeing it and learning it. So in time, I will be able to get them back involved with with doing it themselves and hopefully continue to get the same results when we've got, you know, trying to do it in a more scalable way as well. Totally. I think that's the key, especially with, I think with all the aspects of business, but with prospecting and conversion and that like, new client engagement process it's and we've worked on ours and kids we're still working on ours now um but we've had a couple of big like focus pushes in in the past and it's like you can see every element of the stage and it's easy enough to go okay well, what can we do what do we change sometimes it does mean as you say you step back in get get your hands dirty to to do some of the stuff get that feedback from the front line change some things see what it means get it back to where you're comfortable with then you can go back to trying to scale again and i think it's like this ongoing um you know on ongoing iteration process which you need to do because what people want is changing what's going on what's front of mind for people is always changing as well so i think it's necessary that it's um what you're doing changes with it as well Um, yeah for sure but yeah obviously yeah great, great to see those those outcomes as well Tell me, um, Josh, and I, I could I love talking about like engagement and can conversion, so I could talk about this all day, but I know uh, I, I won't. Um, what's what would you do differently if you could go back? Um, <laughs> if you could if you could go back to like you know you kicking off the business ten years ago, what are the what are the main things that you would that you would change if you had your time again? Jeez, great question. Um, well, just to just to reconfirm, I bought half of an existing business, so that's one key thing there that's probably a bit different to starting a business. I think um, <laughs> I feel like I've probably pretty happy overall with with how I've approached it all, in the sense that I've I've evolved my role a few times. So when I first bought the business, I was completely focused on meeting all the clients we already had and, and being their advisor. I then went through a process of transitioning the majority of the clients to, to new advisors so that, that did allow me to evolve my role and be more of a business owner slash advisor rather than purely a technician. Um, obviously, it's pretty hard to grow your business if you're already full up with with the clients you're working on. But I'd say overall I'm happy with how that's been done and now we're in a position to try and kind of level up and scale it more now that we've got other senior people with the capability to work with clients. Um, and our main challenges now are, are probably efficiencies around how we do things. So the efficiency to actually then get the advice produced and um, and those sorts of things and making sure we're using the technology wherever possible effectively, more so mm-hmm. in the, the back end of all the, the the number crunching and comparisons and compliance that we need to be covering off. I think that's probably our our biggest opportunity. Uh, We have just confirmed um, an outsource power planning solution, which is a a bit of a shift in mindset for our business. It's always had that internally resourced. So, yeah, certainly I'm not sitting here saying we've done everything perfectly and I'm really happy with how everything's gone, but I think that the reality is that it does just take time to evolve a business mm-hmm. and grow a business, especially in the industry we're in with, with so much of our time taken up in recent years around regulatory change. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't say I'd necessarily done anything too differently, but I would have. it would have been nice if, if things had just been able to move a bit faster. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. the nature of it's- it. It's always the way, and I think it sort of talks to that that seesawing that you go like you focus on you focus on your marketing, sales, conversion. Then you're like, okay, now we need to do efficiency. Then you got some team building there, and it's like uh, for small businesses, it's, it'd be great to do them all at the same time and um, cohesively. But the reality is that it just doesn't it just doesn't uh, work like that. So uh, yeah, I think yep. you're right that you got foundations, learn the lesson, see what's not working, and then that becomes the mm. things that you focus on to to get to that to the next stage. Um, yeah, definitely. but Josh, thank you so much, mate, for sharing your insights. Really appreciate that. Um, 
I know you we were just chatting a little bit offline and that you currently, um, you are hiring for at least one role in your business. Do you want to give us your pitch for this for people that are, might be listening? <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Yeah, hopefully there's some good uh, sort of client service um, administration people floating around looking for a role. So we are looking to fill that role. Um, we had someone in that role who's been progressing through our business over four years through her on-the-job experience and also further studies. So she's moving up and uh, into new things and, and looking to, to fill that role. So, yeah, anyone looking for a role like that in Melbourne, we'd love to chat to you. What's the best way for people to reach out, Josh? Uh, so our business is Prosper Advisory and my email is joshp at prosperadvisory.com.au. Awesome, mate. Well, guys, check check that out. Josh, thank you again for sharing your story, mate. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve Spent. Thanks for having me on, mate.